What they promise is love. What they deliver is hate. And the first thing they would tell me, they were so fearful that this man would get them, that he would come after their family or somehow harm them. What they promise is acceptance. What they deliver is pressure. Uh, the peer pressure and the pressure of shunning and the pressure of the, the distorted impression of God and his policeman role um, keeps you in such stress that you don't have any rest or what I call a false peace until you conform uh, to what the leader wants you to do. What they promise is freedom. What they deliver is bondage. I was also expected to sexually service the men in the group and this was when I was just a child and these were grown men and they had wives and everything. What they promise is life. What they can deliver is death. That could be us. We could all be dead. Why, we would do the same thing. Only he wouldn't even have to be there in person. He could just write a letter and we'd all do it. The tragic and fiery outcome of Waco, Texas has renewed attention on fanaticism in the name of God. Behind this disturbing trend can usually be found one central, dynamic, persuasive figure. The leader is the magnet that attracts the respect, love, and complete devotion of his unsuspecting flock. Who is this person who can mesmerize people into such blind obedience that sometimes ends in death? as occurred in Waco and before that in a little-known South American country called Guyana. Today on Day of Discovery, we'll disclose the marks of these dangerous religious leaders. And we're also offering a free booklet titled, How to Identify a Dangerous Religious Group. You may call or write. Both phone number and address will be given at the end of the program. The ruins of this ancient worship center with its altar and stage will tell us that dangerous religious leaders are not new. They have used manipulation for personal gain throughout history. One such dangerous leader was headquartered here at the city of Dan, which is located today on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. After the death of Israel's King Solomon about 925 BC, an ambitious leader named Jeroboam switched the center of worship from Jerusalem to Dan, set up an altar and a golden calf and said, Behold your God. With this new counterfeit God option, Jeroboam manipulated his subjects for personal power, prestige, and prosperity. When we recently visited that ancient city and altar of Dan, I was reminded once again of how this site tells the story of a gifted leader who created a false religion to protect his own interests. King Jeroboam's willingness to manipulate the faith of his followers for his own selfish ambition is a timeless mark of dangerous religious leaders. And on today's program, we're going to weave his story into the experience of people who have discovered to their own loss that the spirit of Jeroboam still lives at the end of the 20th century. Now, how did Jeroboam become dangerous? Well, the circumstances leading up to this king were significant. His predecessor, King Solomon, had broken the first commandment. You know what that is. You shall have no other gods before me. But in an amazing manner, King Solomon, late in years, had built altars to the gods of his pagan wives. And as a result, God himself moved in, judged the house of David, split the kingdom, and gave the northern ten tribes to Jeroboam. Jerusalem and the temple of Israel, however, remained under the control of the tribe of Judah in the south. And as a result, 1 Kings chapter 12 tells us that 
that Jeroboam, being in the north, soon began to fear that if his northern tribes traveled south to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice at the only altar that God had approved, that he, Jeroboam, would eventually lose the hearts of his people to the rival king of the south. Now, with that biblical example of Jeroboam in mind, we'd like you to hear now from some people who in our own time have come under the influence of dangerous religious leaders, leaders who have manipulated the elements of faith for their own personal interests. His was control. He loves to control the people, and he does it through his writings. I mean, um, he controls everything they do from the day, time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night. They have to do everything a certain way, what they eat, how they live, where they sleep, who they sleep with how they raise their children, everything is controlled by one of his writings through his letters. My grandfather had perverted sexual desires and he found a way to say that, that God was with him in them, that God not only excused them, but that God um, propagated it, that, that God wanted it to be that way. You had differences in treatment. The leader and her family were treated very well. They were considered royalty. They got good food, they got good clothes, they had what amounted to personal servants taking care of them all the time who were taught from books on English royalty, on how to serve and not be seen, on the proper attitude for servants. But what you have to consider is the cost of the lives of the people who are doing the serving. The focus is always on the uh, autocratic leader and so the person at the top becomes not a spiritual shepherd but a tyrant and the will to power the need to dominate the need to control becomes paramount and obviously the attributes and the characteristics that we associate with the Christian faith uh, those of servanthood and and those of emulating Christ in all ways those kinds of things fade into the background and are not uh, the kinds of things that immediately come to mind when you when you think of of leader X, Y, and Z. Although the followers don't always see that because uh, they, uh, uh, in a certain sense, have been spiritually brainwashed. But that raises the question then: How does that kind of spiritual brainwashing occur? You ask, how do leaders get that kind of control? To answer that question, we can go back to Jeroboam, that king of the north who set up an alternative form of religion to further his own control over the people. How did he do it? Well, part of the answer is that he used his exceptional qualities of leadership. First Kings chapter 11 tells us that his predecessor Solomon had recognized the evident abilities of this man Jeroboam and had made him a leader. This king reminds us that not only are dangerous religious leaders marked by a hidden agenda, but just as significant is the evident ability, the persuasiveness, the, the God-given charm and grace that makes these men or women easy to follow. It all begins when you first come there and you see this leader and he just looks so neat and just so excited about the Lord and he, when he meets you, you're just like the greatest thing on earth, you know, he treats you great and, and um, like my family when we first came, we, he just opened his arms to us and we just thought, wow, he is just so loving and he just took us around and showed us everywhere and he just, um, you know, just put us in his web, totally. The leader is a, a very dynamic person. Uh, she's capable of talking nonstop for a very long time, uh, making good points. And in the beginning, she was a teacher. Um, there was teaching of salvation, baptism. But over a period of time, I believe that she found that she could get what she, the things in life that she wanted and the power and the control became more important. In addition to their personal strength and charm, another mark of a dangerous religious leader is the claim that, that they've heard from God in a way that the rest of the group hasn't. Watch for words like, the Lord told me, or God wants me to say this to you. Her word was perceived to be God's word. There was no difference. And as she as she treated you, so was God treating you. 
as she used scripture and interpreted scripture, that was the truth, and you didn't question it. I began to see, because I did have a previous Christian background. I graduated from a Christian high school. I had a year of Bible college. I knew that some of my father's revelations were not biblical and they did not coincide with scripture. And that verse at the end of Revelations, it says there not be one word added to this Bible, not a jot or tittle. That really bothered me because my dad always said that his words were God's words for today. And that if it didn't coincide with the Bible, that was okay because he had the new word. There were also a lot of contradictions in his writings. His writings are full of contradictions. And so it made me wonder if it began to make me wonder if the Bible was full of contradictions. If my grandfather, if this man of God, the prophet of God for the end time, if he was supposed to be God's mouthpiece, they literally called him God's mouthpiece. And if he was supposed to be just that, then and his writings were put on a level with the Bible, then if he was so full of discrepancies, what, you know, maybe God was uh, strange too, maybe he was perverted too, like this man. And because they claim to be uh, God's mouthpiece or God's servant or God's prophet or have some kind of direct connection with, with the divine, with God, and they are able to convince people that they have special revelation, they have special truth, that God has visited them in some special experiential way. And they're able to convince their followers that they alone possess the truth or a special version of the truth. And so it is when these dangerous religious leaders convince their followers that they have an inside track, a, a private line to God, that those same followers then feel compelled to prove their devotion to God by giving themselves over to the leader who claims to speak in God's behalf. People who questioned their leadership or their authority were thrown out. Um, they were treated like evil people. They were um, slandered. Um, there was no freedom to ask questions once you were a member, once you were in. The biggest deception is that you need that leader between you and God that that leader takes the place of the relationship you should have with Jesus Christ. That their understandings take the place of your understandings of, of the principle of Christ. And so that whole, that whole concept, the whole core of your Christian belief is, is taken away. And you become a servant of a person rather than someone who's growing spiritually um, in Christ. And so his words were to me that your problem is that you won't submit to me. You won't, I said, you're, you're not submissive. So I tried to explain, well, I've done everything you've asked, but that wasn't enough. So I just looked him in the eye and said, well, I'm telling you that I'll never submit to you in that fashion. And I guess he believed me. <laughs> and then after that, I was not really a candidate. It was like, uh, like you, he was prepping me for the club, for the inner circle. He put the intimidating force on me, like now I'm going to have Dave sign the contract. I told him, no, I'm not going to sign the contract. Uh, I don't think you, he told me, he said, well, the scripture verse he used was, well, a slave is not above his master. I'm saying, well, wait a minute, I, I'm not a slave. You're not a master, you're a pastor. But in the group, your first and only loyalty is only to be to the prophet. At all times, no matter what, you know, if he tells you to leave your mate, if he tells you to leave your children, if he tells you to, whatever he tells you to do, you should be able to do it in an instant, and just in an instant. Religion is the ultimate trump card because that leader is speaking for God and people, who's going to challenge God? If God has given some special message, no matter how much I may disagree deep down inside, how am I going to challenge God? If it's a work situation, yes, we can challenge the boss, we can uh, join with other workers, but in the case of religion, this is a volatile combination. And so this charismatic, powerful leader is in control and vulnerable people following and thinking they're hearing the voice of God. And maybe most troublesome of all is the way a dangerous religious leader will use the name of Jesus, the name of God, 
to draw unsuspecting followers into their web. In the beginning, there was, was God and Jesus Christ and newfound religion. In the end, there was just the leader and her, her will and her control. Unfortunately, Steve's experience is common. Dangerous religious leaders have a habit of offering one thing and delivering another. For instance, another offer is freedom. Think again of King Jeroboam. He seemed to free up his people by telling them that it was no longer necessary for them to make that long, hard trip down to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice. But in time, it became all too apparent that the freedom he offered was really a bondage to his own interests. That pattern of freedom that is replaced with bondage wasn't just true of Jeroboam. It's a typical mark of dangerous religious leaders. The men in the group, the older men in the group who um, either run businesses or are employed, work 12, 14, 15 hour days, regular shifts, um, plus continual side work for the one man who's employed outside, for the one man that's employed inside, he's there anywhere from 15 to 18 hours a day. He has no life with his children. He sleeps separately from his wife. He's made to sleep in the basement. He's not allowed to talk to someone if he's not spoken to first. He's constantly yelled at, constantly beaten down in, into a, it's absolute slavery. I was put on hard labor and I was put on silence restriction and there was no hope of it ever letting up and I couldn't talk, I couldn't share my feelings with anyone that I felt would understand, anyone around my age. Um, if I were to tell my feelings it would be in confession form to my leadership with total fear of how they were going to react to it. So I was constantly in fear. I was constantly on the blacklist at the bottom of the totem pole. They got free slave labor from me and other teenagers that they put with me um, under this house arrest, which they called the teen detention home or delinquent teen home. The young adults are not allowed to develop their own ideas of who I am and what I should be and what I want to do. Every aspect of their lives is dictated and figured out for them. And if they have a problem with it, they're told that they have a spiritual problem and they have to get an understanding on what they're doing wrong and why they have a problem with it and they're told to deal with it. And that kind of response is an indication that these leaders are not trying to serve the interests of those who are following them. They're looking after themselves. And with the result, or with damage to those who follow. For instance, another damage is a loss of personality, a loss of individuality, the loss of a person's right to their own thoughts, their own feelings, and their own choices. Initially, it began with uh, control over the amount of time that we spent. Um, there was not a requirement on how much we gave, but there was a, a subtle pressure and expectation that if you had, you would give. Um, and those kinds of things just continually increased and became more and more intrusive in terms of our lifestyle and in terms of um, our, our family situation uh, to the point where at the end when the entire group kind of exploded um, there wasn't one aspect of life that was not under her control. Um, it, I mean it extended all the way to uh, all of us had the same haircut, we all wore the same clothes, she went shopping for all the clothes. Um, not, there was nothing different about any of us in the group. We were all exactly alike. And we were told when we could go to bed, what time we had to wake up, whether or not we should eat, um, you know, whether we could read the newspaper or watch the TV. Uh, it extended to our marriages, our children. Um, we were basically, uh, the care of our children was basically taken away from us. Um, we were told that we were not good parents, that we didn't want the best for our children, that we were actually um, idolizing them. Um, and, and from those examples, you can see it was just in everything, everything. Which seems kind of ludicrous, actually. I mean, sitting here saying these kinds of things is <laughs> rather embarrassing. Um, 
but if you don't understand the process of mind control or thought reform and the kinds of influence, influences that can be exerted over time and the, the cognitive dissonance that it creates, um, then it does seem very ludicrous. And so from this historic site of Tel Dan, where King Jeroboam set up a golden calf and created a religion to further his own selfish interests, and from the experiences of the individuals that we've heard from, who themselves have been caught in the trap of dangerous religious leaders. I hope the message has come through loud and strong. Don't assume that just because a man or a woman speaks in the name of Jesus, don't assume that just because they talk about God or quote from the Bible, that they're safe. Ask God for discernment and wisdom to be sensitive to those individuals who are misusing the scriptures for their own personal ends. There's someone else that was very much concerned about dangerous religious leaders. Long ago in this very land, a man named Paul labored hard for the cause of Jesus Christ. And after spending some time in the city of Ephesus, he met with its elders, the elders of the church there, and this is what he said from Acts chapter 20. He said to the elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now listen, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. Paul's warning is for us as well. Be careful. Test the spirits. Make sure that the individuals who are leading you are themselves reflecting the spirit of servant leadership that we find in Jesus Christ. First and foremost, I would always say, be careful. Think for yourself. Prove what is being said through scripture. Talk to people that you know and trust. Find people that you can trust. The, if you have a leader in a situation like this, they're, they're an entrusted authority. They are a facilitator. They're not a ruler. No one is holy enough to do that except God himself because he lives in a fire. He's, he, he's holy. He doesn't, he doesn't have the, the motivations that we have. People need checks and balances. Um, we need other people around us keeping an eye on things. As soon as you have one person with absolute power and authority, you're going to have a problem. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. When I was tempted to get bitter against God and to forsake God when I was in the group, I realized that there was no one else for me to turn to when I was in trouble. And so how could I forsake my only help, my only hope? When you're alone and your heart is torn, He's all you need. When you're confused, your soul is bruised, He's all you need. He's the rock of your soul, He's the anchor that holds through your desperate time. When your way is unsure, His love will endure, and peace you will find. Through all the years, the joy, the tears, He's all. I can say that he was faithful and I now know and can stand on what I believe. I feel that he is arranging and planning out all the circumstances in my life and that he's working everything out for his good and that's why I have hope. But then I 
see my life today and I've experienced the awesome power of God's grace. A lot of passages that had very little meaning to us before have a lot of meaning now in terms of being rescued, um, in terms of what the truth really is and how precious it is. But I did know that there was something in the Bible that was making sense, and that's why I left. It was, there was this freedom, this idea of freedom and walking in the Spirit and having a relationship with God. And I, I knew there was something there, but I didn't know where I was going to find it. He'll be faithful to you, though your heart is untrue and your love's grown cold. His forgiveness is real, it'll comfort and heal your sin-weary soul. Through all the years, the joy, the tears, He's all. words of this song are a wonderful reminder that the Lord himself is the only one who deserves our total submission and obedience. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us on today's program, which has focused on how to avoid falling prey to dangerous religious leaders. And because this subject is so important, we'd love for you to call or write and get a free copy of this month's study booklet titled, How to Identify a Dangerous Religious Group. In this booklet, you will learn from those who have walked the descending staircase of dangerous religious groups and have since been delivered from the darkness and fear of what has amounted to spiritual abuse. For your free copy of How to Identify a Dangerous Religious Group, just write to this address. Day of Discovery, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 49555. Or in Canada, write to Day of Discovery, Box 1622, Windsor, Ontario, N9A6Z7. Or you can call long distance, 1-918-251-3400. That's 1-918-251-3400. Thank you for joining us for this program on Dangerous Religious Leaders. Next week, we'll explore how to identify dangerous religious groups how can we separate the counterfeits from the real thing? That's next week right here on Day of Discovery.